like what you see here? Then be sure to subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8, a channel devoted to the history of college football. New videos drop twice a week. Click the card in the upper right corner or the link in the description to subscribe now. And now, on with our feature presentation. April 2nd, 2023. It's the fourth game of the MLB season for both the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Los Angeles Dodgers. And even though it's early on in the season, something about this feels big for Arizona. They enter at 1-2, and, and their first 10 games of the season, on paper, are brutal. The scheduling gods could not have given them a tougher slate of games to start if they tried. As of their first 10, they have to play the Dodgers 8 times. As in, the team that won 111 games last year, which was the 4th most in MLB history, and they have to play the San Diego Padres twice. As in, the team that made it to the NLCS. Six of these ten are on the road, and combined against these teams, the Diamondbacks went 10-20, and 20, winning just 26% of the time. It is a brutal stretch to start off the season, but the Diamondbacks have a golden opportunity here. Win this game, and you've got a series split, which is a pretty good spot to be in considering the circumstances. With all that in mind, here we are, tied as we head to the top of the ninth inning with the score all knotted up at one doesn't get much better than this. A Will Smith home run in the bottom of the first for the Dodgers, and a Dustin Perdomo double to right field for the Diamondbacks in the top of the fifth, and here we are. The bats for the Diamondbacks have been awfully quiet all series, having just six runs through 35 innings to play, and having just 19 hits over the first three games. But if there was ever a time for them to come alive, it's right here. And sure enough, when Cattell Marte gets the offense going with a leadoff double, the Diamondbacks find themselves in business. Time for Lourdes Gurriel Jr., the number three hitter in the lineup, and the man acquired from the Toronto Blue Jays in a trade for Dolan Marshow this offseason, to come up. Gurriel's already got a hit today, and now, make it two, as he hits one past the outstretched arms of the second baseman, Miguel Vargas, into right field for a single. All right, this is a perfect start. You've got runners on the corners and nobody out. This is amazing. This is a dream start to the inning. This is... W wait a second, wait a second, time out. Oh, uh, why is Cattell Marte still running? Why are you sending the runner? Why are you sending the nuts? Spets charges and grabs it. Here comes his throw home. Play at the plate. He's out! He's out! And it stays tied! Welcome to Dumb Decisions. Before I break down what happened here... This whole series is about taking an in-depth look at decisions made by managers and coaches during games that were clearly awful from the start. This isn't something you look bad in hindsight. Rather, this is something you look awful almost immediately. These are moves where your gut instinct tells you right away that there's no way this can possibly work. And sure enough, your gut instinct was smarter than that of an MLB manager or coach. And for this one, we're taking a look at the mind of Arizona Diamondbacks third base coach Tony Perez Chica. Did you know who the third base coach of the Diamondbacks was? Well, now you do. Because Perez Chica wins the incredibly early award for the dumbest send of the 2023 season. And we've got a lot of baseball to play. But considering the circumstances of the game, the runner that was being sent, and the guy throwing the ball to try and make the play, it's gonna be tough to beat this one. Like, really tough. And no, I don't care that the D-backs ended up winning this game. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm happy that they won, and I'm thrilled that they got the series split. But for the purposes of this video and this decision, the Diamondbacks winning doesn't change how stupid this was. It just helps to alleviate and ease the pain. But it's like if I jump off of a 30-story building, and I somehow walk away with no injuries. The fact that it all worked out in the end, and it absolutely could have gone worse, doesn't change the fact that what I did was absolutely idiotic, and I probably should never have done it in the first place. So with that being said, let's take a look at why Tony Perez Chica's decision to sink a Tel Marte in this situation was a horrible, horrible idea. If you've watched any of my dumb decisions videos that I do over on my pro football channel, Jabber Gator 9, and you can watch them all by clicking this playlist card in the upper right corner, you'll know that I love looking at things from a risk-reward standpoint. 
In other words, how great was the risk, what had to happen for this play to work, and by doing this, what would the reward have been? Let's start with what I would have done in this situation, and that is, quite simply, hold Marte at third, and have runners on the corners with nobody out in the game. Sure, you don't score the run right away, but you know what you have? A situation with nobody out and the four, five, six hitters coming up. If you get one hit, or you get one ball into the outfield, you're bringing home that run. And the next man up is this guy right here, Christian Walker, who's riding a four-game hitting streak to start the season, who's a power hitter, and who already has a hit today. Thus far in the season, Walker took 13 at-bats. On those 13 at-bats, Walker either got a hit or got the ball more than 200 feet into the outfield five times, with no double plays. Those are pretty good odds. And if he can't do it, you've got this guy right here, the number five hitter, Corbin Carroll, who in 13 at-bats has either gotten a hit or gotten the ball into the outfield seven times, or more than 54% of the time. So even if you have runners on the corners and you don't necessarily score because you don't send Marte home, you've got a guy who gets the job done 38% of the time and a guy that gets the job done 54% of the time in the heart of the order. And you need both of them to fail to be down to a situation where you can't bring him home just by having the ball leave the infield. In other words, you're in a pretty fine spot, all things considered, with runners on the corners and no one out, considering who you've got coming up. But now, let's look at the alternative, which is sending Marte home and trying to get the run that way. Obviously, the pro to doing this is that if it works, you've got the lead. However, the obvious con is that if it doesn't work, you've got one out, you've got no one in scoring position, and you just blew your best chance of the game. Which raises the question, did this play have a snowball's chance at working? To understand that, we need to look at the runner, Cattel Marte, and the fielder, Moogie Betts. And I'm sure you can see where this one is going. If this was Corbin Carroll on the base paths, fine. Send him. I've got no problem with that. But this is Cattell freaking Marte! As in, a guy who's not very fast. This is a guy who in 2022, averaged 27 feet per second on the base paths. Which not only put him below the league-wide average, but put him in the 41st percentile. And this is coming after a 2021 season where he averaged 26.7 feet per second, ranking in the 43rd percentile. Baseball Savant, which has been an amazing tool, defines a bolt as any time a player's speed reaches 30 feet per second. So anytime they're really flying on the base paths. Cattell Marte, in the last two seasons, has just one bolt. That's it. Corbin Carroll had three on the season alone before yesterday. And yes, I know it's unfair to compare Marte to Carroll, but that's more of an illustration to highlight that Marte is not very fast. He's a below average runner at best, and he's getting slower and slower by the year. Having said that, even though I'm not the fastest runner in the world, if you've got a three-year-old in right field, I'm gonna run on him, because I know he can't reach the plate and throw that far. So it's all relative. Marte might not be the fastest, but if the right fielder who has to make this throw isn't great defensively, then it is a fine calculated risk to take. So who's the right fielder here? Mookie freaking Bess. As in, oh, I don't know, one of the best defensive outfielders, if not the best defensive outfielder in baseball. Running on Mookie is just asking for trouble, considering he won the gold glove last year and in 2020, and in 2019, and in 2018, and in 2017, and in 2016. A below average, fairly slow runner against a man who's won six gold gloves in the last seven seasons. Who do you think is gonna win this? And it's not like the Diamondbacks still know this, because back in 2020, with Marte running the base pass, Mookie Betts somehow pulled this off against him forward he was really good that's a broken bat flare down the line to right and sinks in there for Marte Betts over to dig it out Marte headed to second 
He's going to try for three. Mookie's throw right on the money. Oh, Mookie. I mean, that's an unbelievable throw. But you know how good Mookie it is. You see him do this on the same play you're running, and you're going to send Marte on a play that he can make in his sleep? What's the logic behind that? It's almost like if, in basketball, you double-team a player from the elbow, and he still hits the shot. So you decide that next time, your strategy is to just not cover him from that spot. Like, what do you think is going to happen? It was dumb. It was stupid. And the crazy part is that I'm not the only one who thinks that. Because you know who else hated the decision to send Marte there with the ball in shallow right field? And Mookie Betts about to make a throw? Tori Lovello, as in the manager of the Diamondbacks. Because after the game, Lovello was asked about the decision by his third base coach to send the runner home. And this is what he had to say. Yeah, but first and third and no outs, and you got your, your probably arguably your best run breeze are coming up. So um, all's well that ends well, we say that. <laughs> we all know what that means. The translation of that one, in short, Tony, you are so lucky we won that game. You are so lucky that this decision didn't end up mattering in the long run. Because that was one of the dumbest sends I've ever seen. And you're going to get chewed out afterwards. Tori Lovello has had his problems in Arizona. But you know it's bad when the guy who insisted last year on playing Mark Melanson and Ian Kennedy out of the bullpen every day says, Not even I would have done that. That's when you know. That's when you freaking know you made a bad move. So what do we learn from all this? Don't run on Moogie bets. I don't know why people haven't learned that lesson yet. But it bears repeating. Don't run on Moogie bets. And if you're going to, don't do it when Moogie is in shallow right field and when it's a routine play for him. And if you're going to, don't do it when you've got a slow runner rounding the bases. And if you're going to, don't do it with nobody out in a tie game when you've got hitters who you can absolutely trust to get the job done considering the circumstances. You have to know the situation. And the situation said, quite blatantly, to not run on Mookie Betts. Because when all these elements are in play, you can't exactly be surprised when this play backfires. Talk about a dumb decision. Get your official Jabble Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.